The scriptures tell us of the importance of studying God's Word. The psalmist writes, Thy word is a lamp unto thy feet, and a light unto thy path. In another place, he continues, How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to thy word. We at Calvary Chapel Worship Center believe in teaching through the Bible in its entirety. May your faith be increased at the hearing of God's word. Here now is Pastor Rich. We are back, everyone. This morning, we have the privilege of dedicating one of our little babies this morning. So I'm going to ask the Davidsons to come on up. And many of you know, of course, Kyle Benjamin Davidson that we're going to dedicate this morning. And You know, Kyle, when he was born, um, there was a, a, a trauma around it. And uh, the umbilical cord had wrapped around his neck. And... And so uh, it really became a very difficult time for him, of course, and now he's been diagnosed with cerebral palsy. And uh, many of you have just been praying for this family. And uh, we have just, in fact, would you let me hold him? Come here, Kyle. There we go. And uh, so he has just been doing wonderfully. And the, the family just wanted me to just start by saying thank you. Thank you to everyone that you guys have prayed, served, helped, brought meals, and just loved on this family. And uh, they just want to say how much it means to them. You have blessed them. And now as a church, it's our privilege to dedicate him unto the Lord. The Lord knows. The Lord's hand is sovereign over Kyle. And we just believe that the Lord has a special plan for this little boy and is going to use him according to his glory. And we trust the Lord, and this life is precious unto him and unto us, unto this family, and the Lord's purposes are his. And so we just pray for him that, that we would just see the Lord's blessing unfolding in his life. Amen? Amen? Would you just bless with me as we dedicate him? Mom and Dad, would you just lay hands on, on Kyle and, and let's just bless him. Father, we thank you for the life that you've given to this family. Kyle is such a blessing. And Lord, we know we see all the challenges that have surrounded his birth and all the things that happened. And Lord, yet we saw your hand all through it all and the provision of, of your name and your strength. So we pray now for Kyle as we dedicate him to you. Lord, would you just surround him with songs of deliverance Lord, would you bless him? Would you minister to his heart and to his soul? Would you bless his family? Lord, give them wisdom. Give them provision. Give them protection, Lord, as, we, as they look to you. And we dedicate Kyle to you, Lord, as a, as a gift given to them. We give him to you. And we dedicate him unto you. And thank you for the joy that he's brought to this family and the gift that he's been and will be. So we dedicate him now to the Lord in the name of Jesus Christ. And everyone said, Amen. Can we give the Lord praise and glory? Amen. I'm going to give this to you guys. All right. And there we go. Thank you so much. Thank you. He's doing great. God bless you guys. All right, would you all open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 4? As you remember, we're studying through the book of Matthew on our weekend services, and uh, we're in first. Chronicles during our Wednesday service where we go verse by verse studying the life of David right now but here we are on the weekend studying Matthew Matthew 4 the title of the message is an example of victory let's pray father we look to you to dedicate as we dedicate this time Lord we pray that you would honor your word in our lives we look to you to reveal your heart in Jesus name and everyone said amen so Jesus, as we left him at the end of chapter 3, was baptized in the Jordan River by John and then was led by the Holy Spirit, filled of the Holy Spirit, and he went into the desert now just before he enters into his public ministry. He goes into a period of fasting for 40 days and nights, a tremendously long I mean, for, can you imagine fasting for 40 days and 40 nights? It is possible. 
You might wonder, is that physically possible? Yes, it is. It is, it is a very difficult thing to do. But the Lord fasted for 40 days and 40 nights before he began his public ministry. Now, as we were studying last week, Jesus came as a representative of our sin. Now, we saw this, uh, and we will continue to see this, but even from his birth, and then as a representative of our sin, he was baptized by John, then as a, as a representative of our sin, at the end of that fasting period, he went into a time of severe temptation. It tells us that the devil, the enemy, the tempter, came and tempted him. Now this is really a significant thing. It becomes a significant uh, an event in human history. Because you look back at Adam and Eve. I mean, there are significant things that have happened in the history of mankind. Adam and Eve were in the garden and had everything. I mean, just had everything. But they failed in regards to, of course, bringing sin into their lives. Then you look at Israel in the desert. They were in the desert for 40 years, and they failed in the desert. In fact, the Scripture tells us that the whole generation of Israel that came out of Egypt died there in the desert because of their lack of faith, except for Joshua and Caleb. But then where Adam and Eve failed, where Israel failed, Jesus succeeded. He was victorious in the temptation. Here, Adam and Eve had everything and failed. Jesus had been fasting in the desert and had nothing and succeeded victoriously. Therefore, we say he's an example of victory. Now, so what is important to understand is that Jesus, yes, he's a representative of our sin, but he's also high priest unto the Lord for us. You see, Jesus represented God. Remember what Jesus said, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. But he represented us to the Lord as our high priest. We have a high priest who was victorious over sin, who was victorious over temptation, who was he lived unblemished before the Lord. We say, oh, praise God. There's a great scripture, Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 to 15. Therefore, since we have a great high priest, Jesus, the Son of God, that's our high priest. He was king and he was priest. Very powerful. Jesus, the Son of God, therefore, let us hold fast our confession. No, notice this. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are. We can relate, he says, yet without sin. And so therefore, we can look to Jesus and say, Jesus, you understand. Yet without sin is important to recognize the righteousness of Christ, that victory, spiritual warfare victory, is given to us as a gift, but also an example for we have been given the same Holy Spirit. He was full of the Holy Spirit, and we have the same Holy Spirit. So this example really becomes a tremendous insight into our own victory. Spiritual warfare is a reality everyone is going to face, has faced, will face, are facing. Spiritual warfare is a reality. And therefore, this is a very important uh, lesson for us, beginning in chapter 4, verse 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. And it tells us that the tempter came and said to him, and we're going to look at that. The tempter came at the end of it. So here's the insight that we need to receive today as we're going through this study. We need to understand the schemes of the enemy. We need to understand the schemes of the enemy and our response. We need to be prepared that we would have a response at the tempter, at the things. Many people struggle. They want spiritual victory. They desire spiritual victory. And so there are some great insights for us. One thing we've got to be clear about, this is absolutely an example of spiritual warfare. Jesus becomes the example of spiritual victory for us. And so... If we're going to be victorious, we have to understand the schemes that the devil has. And then our response to it as well. So Jesus, as he's beginning his ministry, is fasting. Now, fasting for 40 days is very possible. And your body goes through interesting transitions. At the beginning of a fast, and if you've ever fasted, 
uh, you know that this would be true. The very first thing that happens when you go to a fast is that you become hungry. In other words, the, you say, okay, tomorrow morning I'm going to fast. Well, as soon as you start tomorrow morning, immediately your thoughts are on food. I mean, you know, you don't, you don't think about food all that much until you try to diet. And then all of a sudden it's the thing you think about most. And you know, partly it's this body of ours, it's this flesh that we have. Isn't that the nature of what we struggle with? I mean, as soon as somebody says, don't, there's something, there's something that rises up and that says, yes, I, now I've got to have it. You know, as soon as we said, for example, if we made a, a let's say we made a Christian law, we, we made a new Christian law that says, here uh, uh, with and after this date, Christians will no longer be allowed to eat chocolate chip cookies. It's the law. You cannot have chocolate chip cookies. Then immediately, you know what's going to happen? Immediately you rise up, got to have chocolate chip cookies. Next thing you know, there's a black market on chocolate chip cookies. I mean, we got to have chocolate. There's something that rises up in us. You gotta, oh, now, now I got to have chocolate chip cookies. Because you said, I can't. This is what Paul says. I didn't know what coveting really was until the law says, you shall not covet. And then it produced in me coveting of every kind. And so what's interesting is that you start out with hunger, but after a few days, actually the hunger goes away. And you can fast for an extended period of time because the hunger actually dies. Now what happens is that the body, of course, it has to have some kind of energy. And so it, it, first it consumes all, you know, it consumes the fat in the body. And uh, that's one of the reasons we have fat, by the way, is to have a reserve of energy. And so aren't you glad to know that there's a reason behind all of that? Uh, we have to have a reserve of energy. And then the body begins to consume, uh, actually, the, the muscles, the protein in the muscles. After a period of time, this will go on for quite some period of time, but after a certain period of time, the body will actually start to consume the vital organs, and then you will die. And so therefore, the body, at the end of it, starts to get hungry again. And when you enter into that period of hunger, you have to eat. And so this is what happened to the Lord. At the end of the 40 days, he became hungry. That was the indication. He better eat now. And that hunger, of course, would be very severe. Now you look at this and you have to say, well, why would he fast for 40 days? It is an interesting question. I think the 40 days is significant when you look through the number 40, 40 years in Israel, and lots of other things that we see, that it's an example again of Jesus coming in regards to our sin. But I think also there is a victory over this flesh. You know, this flesh, this body of ours is really something, isn't it? And, and so when, when there's a mastery over, Jesus came in the likeness of sinful flesh, and in fasting there's a mastery over it. If you've ever fasted, you know that that's one of the results. There's a mastery over the flesh and its desires. And in fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25, everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim, but I discipline my body and I make it my slave. See, this is what Paul gave us as a great insight. I Make it my slave, my servant, so that I have, after I preach to others, I myself will not be disqualified. And so this is important. This body of ours, one of the things we need to understand is that God gave us this body as a servant to accomplish, you see, we should offer that unto the Lord to sacrifice it, you know, for His purposes. Our body makes a great servant, but a terrible master. Amen. A great servant, but a terrible master. You know, anytime the body becomes the master, we just follow along. Well, whatever you want to do. And, you know, when the body becomes the master, we're in trouble. And so this is a very important insight for us. It was at this very point, at the end of the 40 days, the enemy gained, came and began a spiritual attack against the Son of God. So it tells us the very first temptation was this, verse 3. If you are the Son of God. And really, as you study that word if, it actually has a more clear meaning in the original Greek, which is to say since. 
since you are the Son of God, or because you are the Son of God, notice, command these stones to become bread. Now you're hungry. I know you're hungry. So use your authority, use the power that you have since you are the Son of God, and command these stones to become bread. And the answer powerfully and said, It is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now, at first look, this temptation, this first temptation, may seem kind of, you know, simple and straightforward. He was hungry, bread. But in closer look, there is great insight here that we need to understand. And let's see under this, to understand this, let God's word have authority in your life. That's really what's behind this. What is going to be the authority in your life? Let God's word be that authority. Let's, let's paraphrase what the tempter said. Since you are the Son of God, use your authority over these stones to satisfy the desire that you have for food. Your body has a desire for food. Use your authority to command these stones. Now, is there anything wrong with bread? No, there's nothing wrong with bread. That's not the point. Is there anything wrong with sex? No, there's nothing wrong with sex. The problem is the timing. You, are you with me on this? All of a sudden we got kind of quiet there. <laughs> are, we, are, we, are we together on this point? There's nothing wrong. God made it. God gave it as a gift. The problem is timing. And so the, the, the bread, there's nothing wrong with bread. But this is not the time. God had called him into this fast. And so that wasn't the time. Now later on, the angels would minister to the Lord and no doubt bring bread. But God's will now, and this time was to have no bread. Therefore, the answer is no. See, the enemy is tempting Jesus to exercise his authority for his body's agenda. Your body's hungry? Use your authority to satisfy your own needs outside the will of God. There is a great temptation. Satisfy your own needs outside the will of God. There's the real problem. Jesus' answer to the enemy is powerful. Now, he quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 8. So let's look at Deuteronomy. Let's look at the verse in its context to understand what Jesus is quoting here. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. This is Moses as he's speaking to Israel before they enter into the promised land, and he's reminding them of what happened to them in the desert. And this is what he said. God humbled you. Now, notice these verses. This is great. God humbled you and let you be hungry. God, he let you be hungry. What? God let me be hungry? Why would God want me to suffer? Listen to the purpose of the Lord. He allowed you to be hungry. And then he fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, so that he might make you to understand. Maybe God wants to teach us something. Maybe God wants to help us understand something. He says, so that you might understand that man does not live by bread alone. Of course you need bread. But is that where you get your life? Does life come from bread? No, life, he said, he continues. But man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. There's where man lives. Everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. Do you want to truly live? So there's the, you want to live? You want to truly live? Then let God's word, every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. That's how we live. You want to live? Give us the instruction right there. Let God's word have authority in your life. Trust God that he will meet your needs according to his time and his best for you. And there is a great point. It's when we get out of time. It's when we decide, I'll make my own time. Of course sex is a good thing. Of course sex is a good thing. God made it, therefore it's a good thing. Of course it's a good thing. But it's when, it's when we say, I'll make my own time. I'll do it according to my will. I don't know. I don't think God's got that figured out. I've got a better plan. I know my body's got needs, and I know how I'm going to satisfy them. I'll go with my own agenda. And there comes problems. Can I have a little support here? Amen. 
And so there's a great lesson for us to understand. The enemy is not tempting him, by the way, by offering him bread. The enemy is not offering him bread. The enemy is not saying, hey, you want some bread? I got some bread. That's not what he's asking him to do. The enemy is tempting him to use his authority the wrong way. You have authority as a son of God. Use it. Use it for your own personal agenda. Use it for the agenda of your body. I know you're hungry. I know your body wants food. Use your authority to satisfy your body. See, get out from under God's authority. That's what he's asking Jesus to do. Get out from under God's authority. You don't need to stay under God's authority. God, you've got authority. Use it for your own way. Get out from under God's authority. Make your own decisions. Isn't that what he's tempting him to do? But being under authority is the key. You want, to, you want to have the spiritual power and authority in the life that God desires for you? Then the key is to be under God's authority and to let God's word have authority in your life. There's a great point for us to understand. Would you tune in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 8? For, for here in Matthew 8, there's a great lesson on this very point. Matthew chapter 8, verse 5. And when he had entered, when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion, a Roman centurion, came to him and entreating him said, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering great pain. And, and Jesus said to him, I will come and I'll heal him. But this, look at the answer. The Roman centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy for you to come under my roof, but all you got to do is say the word. And my servant will be healed. I know you have authority to just speak the word and my servant will be healed. And then he explains his understanding. He says, for I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me. Notice what he says. I too am a man under authority and then I have soldiers under me. Why does he have soldiers under him? Because he is under authority. Because he's under authority, and he's under authority very well, he then has soldiers under him. And then it says, I say to this one, go, and he goes. And then I say to another one, come, and he comes. And I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. Now when Jesus heard this, he marveled at it. And he said to those who were following, truly I say to you, I have not found such great faith with anyone in Israel. And he's a Roman centurion. But he's understood the point. And therefore, we need to understand the point as well. You want to have authority and power and live spiritually victorious? This is the key. Do you have authority? Of course you have authority. You have authority to make some decisions, don't you? You have authority to make decisions for your life. Don't you? Yes, you do. We all have authority. How are you going to use that authority? The tempter comes and says, use that authority to make decisions for yourself. Get out from under God's authority. You be the boss of your life. You be the master. You be the commander of your life. You don't need God's authority. You be the authority in your life. And there's the tempter right there. There's the tempter making all kinds of trouble right there. First of all, our body is to be under our authority. Isn't that what we were just saying? Our body is supposed to be under our authority. We're supposed to say, do this, and it does it. It's not supposed to be the other way around. It's not supposed to be where the body says, I need this, and then we say, okay, whatever you want. It's supposed to be under our authority. And then we are to be under the authority of God's Word. Then we truly live. You know, God has given us authority over our children. This is an illustration, a point. God has given us authority over our children. And I think that there's, we're having a parenting class tonight. We're going to talk about this tonight. God has given us authority over our children so that we would represent the heart, the character of the Lord to our children in that authority and teach them then when they grow up to be under God's authority. And when, if we allow our children to have an attitude with us who are over them, I don't like the way you parent. I think I'll make my own way. And then we say, okay, well, it was a little too much trouble anyway, you know, so go ahead. 
We're teaching them that when they grow up, they're going to have all kinds of trouble. It's the, it's the child who grows up under the authority of parents that are good and godly, and they respond well to that authority, they will be blessed. Amen? But the youth that grows up and says, I'll go my own way, I don't need your authority, I'll make my own rules of my own life, we can predict that there's going to be a lot of trouble in that person's life. Amen? The same is true with us. If we stay under the authority of God, if we say, God, your word has authority in my life, when your word says this, I'm going to say, you're right, God. You're right, Lord, I need to change. You have authority. You tell me what to do, and I'm going to do it. Your word directs my path. I'm going to walk on that path. I'm not going to turn to the left. I'm not going to turn to the right. I'm going to go down the path you've called me to. That man's going to be blessed. That woman will be blessed. But the one who says, God, I'll need your authority in my life. I'll make my own rules. I'll make my own path. I'll make my own life. We can predict it right now. There's going to be trouble in that life. Amen. Next temptation. The devil took him into the holy city. And he had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple. Now, I've heard various different commentators say uh, this could be 200 feet, could be 500. I heard one even said 700. Well, there's a pinnacle that's on the corner of the temple, and when you're looking down, you're looking right down into the Kidron Valley. And whatever, even 200 is plenty long. No matter what, you're going to die if you fall off. And this is what he said to him. If you are the Son of God, or really, since you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. You're the son of God, right? Throw yourself down. Prove it. Actually, prove who God is. This is what he said. If, or since you're the son of God, throw yourself down. It is written. Interesting. The devil starts to quote the scriptures to the Lord. And he says, is it written or is it not written? He will give his angels charge concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. Let God prove it. I mean, God's word said it. Why don't you let God prove it? Yeah, go ahead and throw yourself down. Let's see, let's see what God does about that one. Let him prove it. And this is a very important thing for us to understand. Don't ask God to prove who he is. Now, we need to understand this for our own spiritual relationship to the Lord because there are some people who set themselves into situations where they demand that God prove it. Prove it. And then when we get into a situation where we demand that God prove it, we're directing God. We're putting ourselves in a position where we're commanding God what to do. And this is the problem. And I love Jesus' answer. Jesus said, on the other hand, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. It is also written that. Therefore, we need the full counsel of God's word. When you take a verse out of context, you're going to have trouble. This is the point. Don't ask God to prove who he is. We need to understand it. Don't ask God to prove who he is. He quotes from Psalm 91, wrongly applied. Psalm 91 does say these things. He's missing some critical things. Especially the one that says, the few verses after that says, and he will trample upon the serpent. He left that part out. But it's interesting. He's quoting from Psalm 91, wrongly applied. See, be careful about wrongly applying Scripture. This is the, really becomes a very important lesson for us because people do it all the time. Warren Wiersbe once said, we can prove almost anything from the Bible. If you want to, you can prove almost anything from the, from the Bible. That is, if you isolate text from its context and then make it a pretext. What does it say in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15? Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be shamed, accurately handling the word of truth. Accurately handling the full counsel of God. That's why we need the full counsel of God's word so that we don't try to isolate some kind of, uh, of, of verse and make it say whatever we want it to say. Don't bring your agenda to the Bible. 
That's the point. Don't bring your agenda to the Bible. You let God's agenda become your agenda. That's the point. And no, don't wrongly apply it. It's interesting, Pastor Chuck Smith told the story. I remember at a conference he was talking about his son who was about to get a spanking. And uh, so the son knew he was in trouble, thought maybe the thing to do would be to quote some scripture. And he said, Dad, doesn't the scripture say, spare the rod and spoil the child? You should be sparing the rod. Try that on a pastor. <laughs> and so wrongly applying scripture. Notice what Psalm 91 says. It says, He... God will give his angels charge concerning you. God gives his angels charge. You don't give the angels charge. You don't tell the angels what to do. You don't tell God what to do. If we just sell it ourselves in a situation like this, then we are the ones that are commanding what the angels of God do, and therefore we place ourselves in a, in a place of authority over God, and therefore, of course, over God's angels, demanding that God fulfill His word according to our agenda. The temptation here is to make God man's servant rather than to have man become God's servant as it was meant to be. Do something so that God's got to react and respond to you, that you're directing Him. God doesn't work that way. In fact, in James chapter 4, verse 3, there's a great verse for us to be reminded of. You ask and do not receive... You ask, you, you ask God and God says, no. I mean, he answered you, he just said no. You ask and don't receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. God says, no, I know what's best and good and right. We need to submit then to there. Here's the essential problem. If God is able to save, if God is able to provide, if God is able to heal, then some set up a situation where they insist that God prove it. Is God able to heal? Yes, God is able to heal. Then someone will say, well, then I'm going to get off my insulin so that God has to prove it. Be very careful. Because you have now set yourself in a position where you're commanding God. Prove it, God. I'm going to get off my insulin, and I'm going to start going into all kinds of problems, and now you've got to prove it. Careful. Be very careful. You know, there's a great scripture for us. Daniel chapter 3. Wow, this is a tremendous verse, a set of verses that give us a lot of insight. Daniel chapter 3. Turn there, if you would, in your Bibles. Look at verse 13. This is the famous story of Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, who were in Babylon with Daniel. And these men were men of renown and wisdom and leadership that Nebuchadnezzar had given them positions. But Nebuchadnezzar had set up this golden image and insisted that everybody bow down and worship, where these three, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, a few refused to do it. Now here comes the part of the story that we need to understand. Verse 13, Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and anger, gave orders to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These three men were brought before the king. Nebuchadnezzar responded and said to them, Is it true? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods and that you do not worship the golden image that I have set up. Now, if you are ready, in other words, let's try this again. Now, if you are ready, at the moment you hear the sound of the horn and the flute and the lyre and the trigon and the psaltery and the bagpipe and all kinds of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made, okay, very well, all is good. But if you will not worship, you will immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. And what God is there who can deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, I, I love this response. This is so good. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king. Now please understand, I believe they gave an answer with all respect, all humility, but in tremendous wisdom. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this. We don't need to give you an answer concerning this. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able. Is, is our God able? Of course he's able. 
Our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of the blazing fire. And surely he will deliver us out of your hand, O king, one way or the other. But even, notice this, even if he does not, then let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods, and we are not going to worship the golden image that you have set up. I believe they said it in all respect and all humility, but with the authority of the Lord. Our God is able to save us, but if he does not save us, we will still not worship you or bow down. Now that is a tremendous answer. My God is able. I know my God is able. This is part of faith. Is your God able? My God is able. But I let him be the commander and the decision maker in my life. Too many people are concerned with their outward circumstances. Why isn't God? God should be doing this in my outward circumstances, but they're forgetting that maybe God wants to do something in the inner man. Is not the proving and the testing and the, and the, the, the faith strengthening that God does, isn't that a right and good thing? Turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter, if you would. We're going to look at a few verses today. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 5. He mentions, he says, you who are protected, notice this, you who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time, in this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. That the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, that your faith may be found to result in the praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The testing, the proving of your faith means something. God's doing something in the inner man. That is very important. In fact, James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3 Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. We have to move along. Back to Matthew chapter 4, the third temptation. Again, verse 8, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and all their glory. Now, that's interesting. The kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said, all these things I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus' answer was so strong. Be gone. Get out of here. Get behind me, Satan. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And there it is. Spiritual victory. Worship and serve God only. Now, there's an assumption behind this temptation. The assumption is that the enemy, the tempter, has the authority to give those kingdoms to him. That's interesting. Luke chapter 4, verse 6 gives us more detail. And the devil said to him, I will give you all this domain and its glory, for it has been handed over to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. That is interesting and insightful. Paul wrote that the enemy is called the God of this world. Now, he certainly holds influence for a time. But ultimately, it will end. And I look forward to that day. In fact, in, in 1 Corinthians 4.4, 4, it reminds us, in whose case the God of this world even has blinded the minds of the unbelieving. There is spiritual warfare here. The God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving. Now Satan is trying to make a deal, right? Isn't that the thing? I'll make you a deal. Now doesn't, doesn't that just sound like the way the world works? I'll make you a deal. Here's the thing. I mean, and, and this is an important thing we need to understand in spiritual warfare. The devil's got a deal. Look, here's the thing. I'll give you this, and then you compromise who you are. All right, how's that sound for a deal? I'll give you this, 
You can have the fun and the, you know, I mean, it's, you're going to be living now. And you go to the parties and stuff, you can have friends, it's going to be life, you're going to have fun, it's going to be one. I'm going to give you all these amazing things, you're just going to have so much great fun. And in exchange, you compromise who you are. You give up your character, you give up your, your integrity, you give up the, the, the joy of your soul, you give that up. But I'll make your flesh something. Ha! <laughs> There's the deal. What do you think? You take the deal? No, the answer is, be gone, Satan. Get out of here. Worship and serve God only. There's the answer. Give you the kingdoms. Give you the kingdoms. My Father's going to give it to me according to the time that He has designed Revelation chapter 11, verse 15, the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ, and He will reign forever and ever. This world and all of its glory. Interesting. This world and all of its glory. Now he's talking about the, 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 the people, the stuff. The worldliness, the temptations, all the things that happen in the cities, all that. You know what I'm talking about. The world and all its glory. Glory? Glory? Well, I'm, you know, if you're going to fish, you've got to make a lure. You've got to make it look like something great. And then you've got to hide the hook. You've got to wrap it a certain way. Make it look like something very appealing. Then you hide the hook. It's glory. Yeah, look at all the reds. And you ever fish? You know, you got reds. They like pink, little yellow, little feathers, something that design. Oh, that is such a... The fish looks at that thing. Oh, wow, look at that. That's a very shiny, bright thing. There's a hook in there. Oh, it's well hidden. There's a hook in there. There's the deal that we need to understand. The world in all its glory is certainly very, very tempting. But to go after those things is to worship them and to serve them. What did Jesus say? Worship and serve God only. You want to be blessed? You see, what happens in your soul is so much more important than whatever happens in your flesh. What happens in your soul. And this is spiritual warfare. And so this is what we understand. The scripture gives us tremendous insight in regards to spiritual warfare. Do all to stand firm. He gives us the equipping so that we can stand firm. Do all to stand firm. Are you doing all to stand firm? This is an example of spiritual warfare and victory. We need to understand the schemes of the devil, yes. But are you doing all? To stand firm. What is all? Well, put on the full armor of God. That's what. Put on the armor that God provides in His Word for us to have spiritual victory. Would you turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6? There is, I think, no other verses that give us such amazing insight into spiritual warfare. Beginning in verse 10. Finally, it says, Be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord and the strength of His might. You want spiritual victory there? Just be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord and the strength of His might. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. You think this is about flesh and blood? No, he said it's against rulers and powers and world forces of darkness against spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. That's what's going on in the world scheme right now. There is spiritual warfare going on in this world. It's what's going on behind, underneath all this thing that's going on right now. Look at the news. This is not about flesh and blood. This is about spiritual warfare. Therefore, you must take up the full armor of God that you may be able to resist in the evil day. And having done everything to stand firm, then stand firm. Having done everything to stand, are you doing everything to stand? See, that's what he's saying. Do everything. Are you doing everything to stand? If you are, then stand firm. How? Having girded your loins with truth, put on the breastplate of righteousness, shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, and in addition to all, taking up the shield of faith by which 
you will be able to extinguish the flaming missiles of the evil one. Then take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. We cannot miss verse 17. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Notice, when Jesus was responding to the enemy, he used the Word of God to do it. This is the Spirit, the sword of the Spirit. The only offensive weapon that we have is the truth. What is the frontal attack of the enemy? Lies. Jesus said, he is a liar, he's a father of lies, he was a liar from the very beginning. Lies. He is a liar. How powerful is a lie? How powerful is a lie? All you have to do is look at the news and see what is the undercurrent of what's happening in the world today and you will see how powerful a lie is. What is the counter to a lie? The truth. The darkness will not prevail against the light. Truth will prevail. Such an important thing for us to understand. Lastly, we also see this in Ephesians chapter 6. Let your soul be filled and overflowing. Be strong in the Lord, verse 10, and in the strength of his might. Let your soul be filled and overflowing. You want to be spiritually victorious. Here's the thing we need to understand. You look at Jesus, and you see that his body was weak. His body was weak. Some say, well, I, I was weak. You see, that's why I fell. I, I was weak. It's not the body that's weak that causes us to fall. It's the spirit that's weak that causes us to fall. And therefore, we need to understand the significance of having our spirit filled and overflowing. You want spiritual warfare? You be filled filled up. Be ye filled with the Holy Spirit and even overflowing. My heart, my soul overflows with the Lord. This is what we understand. Galatians chapter 5 verse 16. But I say walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. What a great insight. The Spirit filled and overflowing. Because when you're hungry the enemy knows just the lure for you. If you're fishing, you don't just pick you got to get the lure that's just for that particular fish that you're going for. Oh, I, I'm going to see, what is it to the trout? Let's see, I'm going to have to use this one. Kokanee, not, I can't use that one, I'm going to use this one. Just the right thing for you. Well, you say, oh, some things don't tempt me. Yeah, that's right. That thing tempts others, somebody else. But God wants us to understand that the enemy does know that which tempts you. Some things don't tempt, other things do. But when you're full and satisfied, then all the things of the world grow strangely dim. That's the key. What are you feeding your soul with? Let your soul be satisfied and overflowing. Take a look at your soul. And God would say that to me, all of us. Take a look at your soul. Is it filled and overflowing spiritually? If you're spiritually weak, you do not have what you need to be victorious. Let's pray. Father, we so thank you for the insight of your word and how you move by revealing to us the schemes of the enemy. You've even given us, Lord, our response so that we can be ready and victorious. Lord, help our soul to be ready, that we would be equipped with the word of God that our soul would be filled and overflowing, that we would understand that we need to be under your authority, that your word would direct our lives, direct our steps, that we would say, yes, God, you say it, and I'm going to follow. And I'm not going to try to command you to do what I want you to do. I'm going to say, Lord, 
I trust that you have the best in your heart for me. Church, I want to ask that we would pray. Is there anyone this morning who would say, Lord, I need my soul to be filled and overflowing. I need more spiritual victory in my life. And therefore, I'm asking, Lord, would you fill and overflow my soul? Would you pour out your Holy Spirit? Because I need more spiritual victory. I need to be strong in the Lord and the strength of His might. Would you pour out that into my life now, Lord? Because I need that spiritual victory. I'm asking for it, Lord. Equip me that I would be victorious. Just raise your hand unto the Lord and say that. Would you do that? Lord, this is my heart. This is my prayer. This is what I need. This is what I ask for. Would you meet me here? Would you pour this out to me, Lord? Father, we are so thankful for you. Light of the world. Chase away the darkness. Reveal the truth of who you are. Minister to us by your Spirit. Pour out your life. Pour out the Holy Spirit that it would overflow in our church and revive us, Lord. Blow like a wind through us. Blow like a mighty wind, a rushing wind, Lord, that changes and transforms and renews us and revives us. We pray that now in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And everyone said? On behalf of Calvary Chapel Worship Center and Pastor Rich Jones, we thank you for ordering this message. Our prayer is that God will use it in your life to increase your knowledge and your love for Him. If we may serve you in any way, please contact our church office at 503-642-2003 or on our website at www.calvaryhillsboro.org. On behalf of all of us at Calvary Chapel Worship Center and Pastor Rich Jones, May God bless you.